Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Hello and good afternoon and welcome to the MIT Forum for Equity. My name is Rod McCollum. I'm a 2016 MIT Knight Science Journalism Fellow and a science writer and journalist. I will moderate today's event. The Forum for Equity is sponsored by the MIT Federal Credit Union, MIT Professional Education, MIT Sloan Executive Education, and the MIT Hand, Mind, Hand, Heart Community Innovation Fund. And by the way, please accept our apologies for running a few minutes behind. We really appreciate it. We welcome your questions and input during this discussion. A reminder that conversations on equity are often difficult, and we all benefit from active listening and respectful communication. Please welcome our guest today, Dr. Samuel L. Myers. Dr. Myers is a 1976 PhD alum in economics. Dr. Myers is the Roy Wilkins Professor of Human Relations and Social Justice and directs the Roy Wilkins Center for Human Relations and Social Justice at the University of Minnesota. We'll post a link to Dr. Myers' full bio in the chart. We're here to discuss the topic and research behind Dr. Myers' 2018 book, Race Neutrality, Rationalizing Remedies to Racial Inequality, co-authored with Inhuk Ya. We've asked Dr. Myers to start with a brief overview of the book, followed by a closer look at a few of the concepts examined within it. Welcome, Dr. Myers. Well, thank you very much, Rod. I appreciate this opportunity to uh, come back home uh, to uh, uh, one of the most cherished parts of my career. And I should begin by saying that I owe a great debt uh, to the leadership of the economics department, uh, Paul Samuelson and uh, Robert Solo. And uh, I published and I uh, special edition of the Russell Sage Foundation's uh, Journal of Social Sciences, a uh, retrospective analysis of the effects of the 1968-1967 riots and the impact that it had on thinking at MIT about uh, issues of inequality. And so what I'd like to do is, uh, I'll share my screen with you uh, right now. Uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, where we've come after 50 years of uh, questioning what should we do about racial inequality. So I began by saying that in 1968, uh, uh, Bob Solo and Paul Simons and other members of the Economics Department uh, at MIT uh, gave some very serious thought about uh, how we're going to try to solve some of these problems of uh, deep racial divisions in uh, society. And it turns out that one of the answers to the question uh, was, well, we really need to produce more black economists. And um, up until uh, 1971, uh, there had never actually been, uh, maybe it's 1970, there had never been uh, any native born black uh, PhDs in economics who graduated from uh, MIT, despite the fact that when Paul Samuelson was a graduate student at uh, Harvard University in the 1930s, there were two Blacks uh, who uh, uh, got their PhDs in economics in Harvard University. And in fact, between 1934 and 1955, uh, there were five Blacks who got their PhDs in economics from Harvard University, but zero Blacks had gotten their PhDs in economics uh, from MIT uh, between the period of 19, uh, you know, I guess, 42, 44, uh, when Samuelson uh, came to MIT, uh, to 1976. And so zero Blacks had gotten their PhDs in economics from MIT. Uh, but then, uh, between 1972 and 1980, uh, there had been 15 Blacks uh, who had been in the uh, PhD program uh, in MIT. And there, there was a book that, um, um, uh, that was written about Blacks at MIT that talks about this uh, legacy of production, of uh, amazing production of Black uh, economists at MIT through this short period. Uh, between uh, the early 70s and the uh, early 80s. 
So this is kind of the context because I'm trained at MIT and I'm trained to think, you know, in a particular way about uh, policy, you know, problems. And what I want to do, uh, and this is all, uh, as you pointed out, this is all described in my uh, my co-authored book uh, called Race uh, Neutrality. But um, let me first try to put uh, into a broader, um, you know, framework uh, the issue of trying to find remedies, remedies to why racial disparities uh, and uh, and virtually every aspect of socioeconomic life. And I'm going to talk about one reason why it's difficult to have conversations about remedies. It has to do with white people. It has to do with white people think. What white people think the problem is that we're trying to solve. And I think that the uh, easiest way in order to articulate this is to say that if the majority group doesn't think that's a problem, then there's going to be difficulty coming up with a solution you know, to that problem. And then I'll do an illustration from an area where I've spent some of my life uh, you know, focusing on. And this is the largest, biggest, least publicized affirmative action program in America. And I was to public procurement and contracting. And it turns out that it was under the leadership of, uh, of um, uh, President Clinton, uh, who argued, men affirmative action don't end it. And so it's an interesting solution to the cause to eliminate affirmative action. And I would argue that the creation of this new program uh, called Race Neutral Program was kind of both a promise as well as a dilemma associated with efforts to remedy inequality. And then I'll uh, open up for questions and comments, even though I think the bottom line uh, kind of, of what uh, uh, my own view is, uh, is let's be careful about trying to find the magic book. Let's be careful about assuming that what works in healthcare is what will work uh, in swimming. Now let's be careful about uh, what we think works uh, with respect to admissions to STEM programs will also work in admissions to uh, art history you know, programs. So point is that maybe we should be focusing on looking at narrowly tailored solution to specified problems and not assume that the problem associated with the fact that the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City has only had two African-American curators in their entire 175 year you know, history. Uh, but that's kind of a different problem associated with the problem that uh, it took a long time before the National Football League you know, had any black quarterbacks. So just be careful about using uh, the idea that there's one simple solution to all these different types of problems. I know that it's romantic to be able to say that it's one problem and therefore there's one solution, but I'm going to make the case that there are different problems and therefore we might be um, uh, better suited to identify you know, different types of solutions. So America's burning. I live in Minnesota. I'm a proud Minnesota. I love it here. I really and truly love living in Minnesota. Minnesota is one of the best places in the world to live. But I'm gonna tell you, it is disconcerting to wake up in the morning and see the streets burning. But this is not the first time that the streets have been burning. This is not the first time that there's been civil you know, unrest. This is not the first time where innocent black people have been shot by you know, uh, largely black police departments. And turns out that earlier when people said, well, it's not about race and it's about place. Now what we need to do is we, get, 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 we need to get more police officers who actually live in the city. But the problem with that solution is that it runs up against the, the notion of well, what are your freedoms? Do you have a freedom to live where you want to live? And so by denying that there was a race component to what obviously is a, a, a race problem, we kind of sidesteps. And say, because I'm talking about Minnesota, I'm going to say Minnesota is a progressive state. Minnesota is, uh, has been a leader in many aspects of, of philanthropy and uh, strengthening nonprofit organizations. But I'm telling you, it's difficult, extremely difficult to get people to wrap their heads around the notion of racial disparities because it's an egalitarian state. 
they believe in fairness. And so the question is, how can the cause of the racial disparities in Minnesota be due to race? Because we don't have any race in this town. If we don't have racism in this town. And so I'll say that uh, perhaps we should uh, look at uh, these different components of white racial disparities and challenge what is the problem. And so let me begin by talking about uh, black white uh, main uh, incomes. Uh, when I uh, was hired at the University of Minnesota uh, in the uh, first endowed shed named after uh, a, a, a civil rights, a black civil rights leader at a major research uh, university's public policy school, I gave a presentation that pointed out that black white uh, ratios of uh, mean family income hadn't changed that much, you know, between uh, the 1960s and 1990s. And people were astonished. They were astonished. I mean, at the time I moved to Minnesota, we had a black uh, um, um, uh, uh, I was about to say we had a, a black coach of the of the Vikings, but maybe we had a black we had a black quarterback. But I'm trying to say that this people believe that changes have occurred. And it's hard for them to wrap their heads around the fact that the relative well-being of blacks and uh, 1992 was not that much different from the relative well-being of Blacks uh, in um, uh, 1969. And so uh, you might want to ask the question about, well, do you think that Blacks' well-being was greater, was the improvement was greater in areas where we had civil disorders and areas where there was something that was akin to the Black Lives Matter movement. But in fact, it was a civil disorder that was uh, uh, the cause of uh, destruction of many industry areas. And so in the, uh, um, the special edition of the Russell Sage Foundation, uh, uh, and um, uh, that's commemorating the current commission report, Susan Gutt and I, you know, map out the fact that the ratio of black white earnings pretty much was about the same, you know, between the right cities and the non right cities after the right. And even though somewhat ironically, the ratio of black white income uh, uh, was actually higher in the right cities as opposed to the non right So what is the point? The point is number one, rights didn't solve the problem. The point number two, whether or not uh, uh, you uh, believe it or you don't believe it, it turns out that the relative economic well-being of blacks in 2016 is no different than it was in 1975. So what are some of the explanations for these wide racial gaps? One is that there are skill deficits, low educational attainment, lack of cognitive skills and co uh, core competencies in mathematics and readings. And so this is kind of the kind of the common economic explanation. I call it the Chicago School explanation, in fact, uh, because it's kind of like the human capital uh, um, deficits. And the problem with the deficits is that it doesn't answer the question of why are there these deficits? It doesn't answer the question, is, uh, well, what is the historical uh, antecedents to the deficits? And so if you ask, why didn't MIT have any PhDs in economics before 1976? It can't be because there were no Blacks who are qualified to have PhDs because the PhDs that the, uh, uh, that the uh, leading economists in MIT had, were from Harvard, and many of them got their PhDs at the same time that there were some brilliant Blacks who got their PhDs from Harvard in the 1930s and 1940s. So it's kind of hard to conclude that uh, the problem is just simply absence of, of skills or uh, educational attainment, because historically there have been people who had the skills in educational attainment. Then another explanation has to do with behavioral deficits, you know, social you know, networks. I frequently hear people talk about uh, rap music. They talk about acting like they're white, or they talk about uh, wearing your baseball hat backwards and your pants falling down. Uh, Bill Cosby, you know, frequently made that comment about uh, behavioral uh, deficits. But I don't think that you know, poor inner city blacks have any monopoly, you know, on the behavioral deficits that Bill Cosby was talking about. 
then you have structural impediments uh, to the equal opportunity, like uh, segregation and some really interesting you know, research is going on about the legacy of segregation on the uh, housing prices, for example. Um, ex extraordinarily interesting data that looks at uh, racial gaps in housing prices in 2019, uh, 2018, and whether or not there was uh, redlining in 1940s. Okay, so that's one of those instances where something has a long lasting impact, but yet uh, nobody seems to uh, believe that it's due to uh, the uh, explicit intentional discriminatory behaviors. And then the last one is racial discrimination. And the problem with racial discrimination is that economists have frequently viewed this as a residual. It's, it's left over after you've taken care of everything else. And if we have time, I'd like to try to talk a little bit about the distinction between racial discrimination and racism, and racial discrimination and structural or uh, systemic uh, racism. Okay, but uh, as an economist, my, I know how to measure racial discrimination. Okay, I, I think we are not yet where we need to be as scientists and as, uh, as researchers in measuring uh, systemic racism or or structural racism. So with that said, uh, I think that we need to have a, a concept, you know, a theory about what remedies are attempting to do. And so within the uh, conventional approach to a policy analysis, uh, you first need to ask the question about what is the problem that the remedy is attempting to solve? Why we're attempting to solve the remedy, uh, to solve the problem? You know, what's the justification for the remedy? And then one of the criteria for evaluating uh, the remedies, is the remedy fair, is the remedy efficient, or uh, uh, are there other criteria for evaluating remedy? Constitutionality, administrative feasibility, sustainability. Now let me talk about efficiency. The economists have a love affair with efficiency and much of the current research among economists has been focused on the efficiency of different types of interventions, like the efficiency of affirmative action or the efficiency of racial profiling. Okay, and it's so, it's amazing. It's really amazing that some of the most highly cited articles that deal with racial differences in police use of force and racial differences in, uh, in uh, police stops and racial differences of rest. But some of the most highly cited work that's kind of like the core of what economists learn about has to do with the efficiency of it. And I'm thinking about so what's wrong with economists? Well, I see that economists are framing this only in the context of efficiency. And the answer is that we have very good models of efficiency, but we don't have really good models of, of equity and fairness. But then in addition to equity and fairness, you have issues of constitutionality. You have issues of administrative feasibility. We have issues of whether or not something can actually be implemented. I mean, you can have a great idea, a great remedy, but yet for some reason or another, um, between the time that the legislation passed and the time that it makes its way through the court system and it deemed to be uh, constitutional, they have difficulty just doing the work of implementing. And an example has to do with the issue of racial disparities and loan denial rates. There's a law. It's called the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. It goes all the way back to 1975 or 1974. It's been illegal to discriminate based on, uh, on uh, different aspects of, 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 uh, of the loan, uh, the loan terms, on the loan amounts, uh, the duration of loan. And, but we, what we discovered is that it's really tough to enforce that law. And one reason why it's tough to enforce the law is that one, we don't really put much of our money into the Federal Reserve or the, the regional reserve banks or in there for uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, Office of Control of the Currency or the other regulatory um, agencies to enforce it. We don't put the staff, we don't put the time, we don't have the methodology. And it turns out that many of the people who responsible for enforcing the law of people who don't believe that there is really any discrimination. What we say is, oh, no, no, no. The reason why uh, single black women are more likely to be denied loans than uh, 
the um, uh, married white couples is the fact that they're single. It doesn't have anything to do with their rights, or it has, has to do with their credit scores, or it has to do with their credit worthiness, or it has to do with their income. And my response says, well, you know, let's control for credit scores. Let's control for income. Let's control for location. Let's control for all the different factors. And then ask the question, are, you know, uh, a single white uh, black woman uh, treated differently from, uh, from white married couples? But turns out that that type of methodology is harder to convince people about because they're beginning with the premise that there is no discrimination. If they begin with the premise that there's no discrimination, it's harder to get them to enforce the anti-discrimination laws. Okay, so then uh, uh, there is the question of uh, whether or not uh, some remedies uh, uh, work and uh, some are uh, more efficient or they are more fair. And so this is an analytical way of thinking about uh, the evaluation of, of uh, remedies. So uh, what, what I'd like to point out is that the remedy to the problem depends on what the problem is that we're trying to remedy. So the question is, what is the problem? The remedy is designed to solve. And so I thought there are a lot of different problems. And so there's one problem, discrimination. But there are different types of discrimination. There's current ongoing discrimination. There's what's sometimes called passive discrimination. And that's when a, a participant in a market process is not consciously, actively engaging in discrimination against a protected group member, but positively engaging in uh, interactions in the market with individuals who do discriminate. They certain say, that's not me discriminating, rather this me being in a market where other people discriminate, but I acquiesce to those other people's discrimination. That's what we mean by passive discrimination. And then you have historic past discrimination and it turns out that that's a harder one constitutionally to remedy because if it's historic past discrimination, the linkage between current disparities and what happened in the past is frequently uh, elusive. But economic historians have gotten to be pretty good and pretty savvy in being able to link up uh, you know, census data from the 1930s and uh, uh, census track information as well as information on uh, racial covenants and uh, been able to uh, link that data to current home market disclosure act data uh, and other information in the 19, uh, in the 2000s. So that's one type of problem. Now there's another type of problem of past wrongs or atrocities and slavery uh, is kind of like one of the better stone of, of the past wrongs or atrocities. But then there's rape and sexual exploitation, there's theft of land, there's genocide. And it's, it turns out that the problem of slavery, rape, theft, and genocide isn't always exactly the same as the problem of current ongoing discrimination. So be careful about trying to find a remedy that's trying to do all these different things at the same time. And then what about the problem of black access to opportunities? Prevention of acquisition of valued inputs, uh, prevention of opportunities through private networks, religion, marriage, custom. And so if you go to a place uh, like, uh, like India and you think about uh, the role that marriage plays and the role that religion plays in the acquisition of uh, assets, the fact of the matter is, it's very unlikely that a Dalit will marry a Brahmin. And the access that Dalits don't have to education, to wealth, to uh, um, um, uh, other valued inputs, is very much rooted in some customs. Religious, despite the fact that the 1949 uh, uh, constitution and the uh, ban of uh, the, uh, the caste discrimination, and despite the fact that there are a number of explicit affirmative action programs in, uh, uh, and are designed to um, eliminate the effect of caste uh, on uh, inequality. But the fact is, is that custom persists 
you can pass a law, but does it mean that people get married to the, a different group of individuals? And then you have issues of the legal framework, legislation, state enforcement, like for example, uh, the, uh, uh, the misinformation laws uh, in um, the United States. So for example, the definition of what is black in America. So uh, in the Plessy versus Ferguson the Supreme Court case, one of the many issues that was addressed has to do with the role of the state in defining what your race is. And it turns out that there's some interesting paradoxes about having the state define, you know, who's black and who's white, as opposed to who is a, a federal registered tribe member, as opposed to who is not an Indian. And so for uh, Indianness in America, it is based on how much of Indian you are. But for Blackness in America, it's defined as how little of the amount of Black that you have. And so that's kind of like the one drop rule. And it turns out that these legal frameworks and legislation have dramatic impact, effect on uh, access to uh, opportunities. And then you have uh, not actions by the state or the, uh, the legislature uh, or enforcement of laws, but inaction or the lack of enforcement. And so those are different types of problems, different types of uh, different aspects of racial inequality. And my point is just simply, don't think that one remedy is gonna be able to solve the problems associated with all of those different types of, of racial uh, inequality. So uh, before we get to the, nation, the notion of race neutral remedies, let me talk about uh, the concept of race conscious remedies or caste conscious remedies or gender conscious remedies. And so they include reservations, they include set-asides, they include quotas, uh, which are offensive in America, but they're not offenses elsewhere in the, in the world. Okay, so if you want to assure the X percent of the total uh, entries to the National Law School of, of, uh, of India or uh, the least, then you state X percent. Of course, you could use it, but use different rules to say that those X percent will be the highest rank the least. And so you have two scores. And I actually was on a missions committee one time. And I was on a missions committee and people said, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna have two lists. We're gonna have the list of whites and we'll have the list of everybody else. And we'll rank the whites, whites from the top to bottom and then we'll list the everybody else from top to bottom. And I was in the room and I said, you know, that does not sound offensive. And they were saying, but this is our way of committing ourselves to admit a more diverse population. And I said, I wouldn't want to be in the room after the fact that I had ranked people separately where deeply embedded in their subconscious, there's a notion that the top blacks are inferior to the bottom accepted whites. If you use an emissions process that explicitly ranks people in a way that values something like test scores and um, grade point averages. And then for the purpose of remedying the problem of the representation, you admit the minorities who you believe otherwise wouldn't be admitted, but for the fact that minorities, how then do you think faculty members are gonna interact with those students? Now, by the way, I'm not making the case of the stigma for reduction. I'm making the case about the mechanism that is producing and reinforcing what I'm gonna talk about uh, in a moment, the racist voice or the part of people who are invoking the affirmative action. And then you have uh, affirmative action as another uh, form of uh, race conscious uh, remedies. I actually thought uh, when I began my work in this was that if you didn't explicitly uh, uh, allocate uh, slots for admissions, employment or business contracts, uh, for a racial minority group, but you merely had an aspiration or you may have had something like a summer program that it would not be race conscious. But the, the courts have uh, argued that the moment that race is used as one of the selection criteria, that is a race conscious program. 
And then you have targeted recruitment, mentoring, subsidies, and other uh, incentives, which fall under the category of race conscious remedies. Now, in contrast to race conscious remedy, you have race, gender, uh, race, and gender, and caste neutral remedies that like Glenn Lally uh, calls colorblind uh, remedies. And we don't have time to talk about this dispute between what's colorblind as opposed to what's race neutral, but simply, Race neutral doesn't mean that you're not taking account of race. Let me be very clear about that. Race neutral does not mean that you're not taking account of race. Okay, but, but that's that. I want to point out that some of the most uh, uh, widely uh, heralded uh, race neutral uh, remedies include things like racial economic uh, development programs, top 10% programs like at the University of, uh, of Texas. Uh, which actually was the source of uh, a major um, uh, series of Supreme Court cases and Court of Appeals cases in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, so I used to teach at the University of Texas. That was my first major you know, position. And in fact, the guy who was the dean at law school then became president of the University of Minnesota when I was at Minnesota. And so there was kind of like this view at Texas, what can we do to avoid a lawsuit as opposed to what happened in the University of Michigan is that what can we do in order to support uh, the, uh, the goals of having a diverse uh, population? And then you have something called emerging small business uh, enterprise programs and empowerment zones. So what makes these race neutral? What makes them is you're trying to solve a race disparity. But in trying to solve the race disparity, you use information about differential uh, representation of race within subgroups, like for example, people who live in inner city, like for example, people who live in depressed areas, for example, um, uh, firms that are small business firms, or for example, uh, the fact that there was segregation in high schools in, uh, in Texas, and if you took the top 10% of the graduates of Houston high schools, Dallas high schools, um, um, and um, if, if you took uh, the, the largest cities in Texas, uh, San Antonio high schools, then you're going to get more minorities than if you take the ten, top 10% of San Angelo or, uh, or um, you know, some rural school in, uh, um, and some uh, in uh, Texarkana. And so what I'm suggesting is that knowing that there's segregation of schools in Texas gives you a um, uh, algebraic uh, calculation that says, even though we're not targeting race, we're targeting place in the graduation but because we have segregated schools, it's going to turn out that we're going to likely to get more minorities using this, uh, what, what is called race neutral uh, remedy. But the problem with it is that it relies on prior discrimination, relies on, relies on prior inequalities in order to justify it actually working. Okay, so uh, what are some of the remedies? And so remedies include equal opportunity, anti-affirmative action, uh, I'm sorry, anti-discrimination, affirmative action, reparations, anti-racism, reconciliation. I'll make the case that uh, these different remedies remedy different problems. And so we do have the problem of, uh, of the beliefs about what the problem is that we're trying to remedy. And so there's something called the General Social Survey, which is uh, run out of the, uh, the uh, National Opinion Research Corporation, uh, which has information that goes all the way back to the 1980s, 1960s, and concerning people's beliefs about inequality. And so the question that's asked uh, is, on average, Negroes, Blacks, African-Americans have worse jobs, income, and housing than white people. Do you think the differences are mainly due to discrimination because Negroes, Blacks, African-Americans have less inborn ability to learn 
uh, because most Negroes, Blacks, African Americans don't have the chance for education that it takes to rise out of poverty because most Negroes, Blacks, African Americans just don't have the motivational willpower to, to pull themselves out of poverty. And so what is it that white people believe about the causes of inequality? And um, turns out that the 2020 data hadn't been collected, and well, I don't think it's available yet to the public. Uh, the 2018, this, this uh, particular version of the survey comes out every two years. So I have the data up to 2016, which is before Trump. And I'm just looking forward to analyzing the data for 2018 to see what it is that happened during Trump. But the question is, what do white people believe? And so it turns out that for the various reasons, by the way, you can check more than one box here, for the various reasons for why uh, there uh, is inequality, you have a non-trivial minority of whites you know, who believe that the problem uh, is uh, inborn disability. Yes, it's true that that number is going down uh, from the 1980s to 2000, but there's still a non-trivial number of white people who, but a, a non-trivial, a statistically significant, a sizable minority of white people who think that blacks have an inborn disability. And that's the reason why there's inequality. And then you have another explanation that uh, is due to, uh, to uh, lack of will lack of motivation. And although even that uh, number uh, has dipped uh, from the 1980s to uh, the 21st century, it's still the case that the vast majority of whites believe that the reason for the uh, racial disparities and uh, and these various uh, outcomes like income and housing and employment, education, attainment has to do with lack of will. Okay, now that's very serious. Now, how many people think it's discrimination? Well, it turns out the majority of people don't think that it's discrimination. Okay, so first fact, first fact is that the vast majority of whites believe that racial inequality is due to lack of will among blacks, and a sizable minority of whites believe that racial inequality is due to inborn disability among blacks. I'm not talking about 1930s. I'm not talking about 1950s. I'm not talking about 1980s. I'm talking about the 21st century. I'm talking about 2016. Okay, next fact. The vast majority of whites do not believe that the cause of racial equality is discrimination. And so I can compute uh, across these, uh, these years uh, whether or not the answer to the question was not discrimination and just for whites. And it turns out that uh, this number kind of differs uh, across different uh, educational levels. And it turns out that less well-educated uh, whites are more likely to say that the problem is not discriminated, discrimination. Uh, more highly educated whites are, are more likely uh, to say that, uh, uh, that less likely uh, than other uh, whites to say that it's not due to discrimination. Let me point out that this big dip between 2014 and 2016 is something that requires a little more investigation about what is it about the, uh, the differences among educated whites and less well-educated whites about their perceptions and beliefs. But it turns out that we still have the vast majority of whites, when you, by the way, there are more less well-educated whites than there are educated whites in America. And so what is it that explains how the vast majority of whites don't think that the problem of racial equality is discrimination? And so the next thing, uh, it has to do with uh, the fact that the vast majority of whites in America are opposed to affirmative action. The way the question is worded, you would also conclude that the vast majority of whites are opposed to race conscious program. Now remember the last year that I have here is 2016. And I think that something dramatic happened during the summer of 2020. And there were some polls that showed that the views of whites had, had changed during that period. But then shortly after those polls were taken, where there was a change in people's views, uh, there seemed to be a, 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 a resurgence of beliefs that uh, they're opposed, that white people are opposed to race conscious 
uh, interventions. I mean, basically saying that the vast majority of people in America are opposed to race conscious interventions. And it turns out that it is true that the less well-educated whites believe that racial preferences hurt whites, uh, but that the majority of whites uh, of all educational uh, levels believe that whites are hurt by racial preferences. And so it turns out that the lawsuit against Harvard, uh, which is uh, brought by Edward Bloom, uh, who's been you know, kind of one of the big you know, advocates for, uh, for dismantlement of affirmative action, doesn't focus on whites, but to focus on Asians. I and mean, that's tricky. I mean, that's actually a clever trick to say, well, let's make the case that affirmative action hurts Asians so that we don't sound like we're racist. But it turns out that it's still the case that uh, across all education levels, there's a substantial share of, of whites uh, who believe that race conscious programs hurt white people. Okay, so it turns out that there's a relationship between people's um, beliefs uh, about um, uh, affirmative action and their beliefs about uh, what the causes of uh, inequality happen to be. And so uh, you can do a, a, a logistic analysis of estimating uh, the probability that an individual is uh, opposed to affirmative action. You control for age, education, gender. You can put in year fixed effects. Uh, you can put in vision fixed effects and then you control you know, for uh, you know, the education levels of uh, the respondents, and you can also control, you know, for whether or not people don't believe that discrimination is the cause of the racial disparities. And the largest, the biggest, the most substantial predictor of opposition to race conscious program is the belief that the problem isn't discrimination. Now, I realize I'm running out of time, and so I'm gonna skip uh, my detailed discussion of, uh, of federal programs uh, designed to, uh, to reduce uh, uh, the underrepresentation of women and minority owned business enterprises through uh, the use of race neutral goals. But the, I'm just gonna go straight to the conclusion, and the conclusion is that uh, uh, and the analysis that I used that uh, the race neutral goals didn't help. Justice Kavanaugh is a big supporter of race neutrality. The idea of let's solve the problem of racial inequality without directly targeting race. And the answer is be careful because it doesn't work. It, well, there are a lot of different reasons why it may not work. It might work because of poorly advertising, poor implementation, but I'm gonna tell you, <laughs> it doesn't work. But this is just one market and this is public procurement and contract. So in conclusion, uh, and I hope that uh, Rod will make this uh, PowerPoint available to anybody who wants it so you can get the references. But in conclusion, race conscious programs are on the top and the main reason why they're on the top is that white people don't think that there's a problem or at least they don't think the problems of discrimination. Race neutral programs sometimes don't work. And so my conclusion is, well, we, may, we need to target remedies to the specific problems we're trying to solve. And it's entirely possible that in some instances, a remedy uh, uh, that works in one industry uh, won't work in another industry. With that said, let me stop. <laughs> I want to answer your questions. The book is called Race Neutrality, Rationalizing Remedies to Racial Inequality, uh, and it's available at Amazon. Okay, I'm now going to stop and answer uh, the questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Dr. Morris, for that fascinating discussion. A reminder to those of us that are joining, you can ask questions via the Q&A tool on Zoom, or you can comment on what you're hearing in the chat. Uh, my first question is to Dr. Myers. I'm wondering, how did she come up with the topic for the book? Was this based on current news or current developments, or had you been thinking about it for some time, possibly? Uh, so the answer to the question is that they, uh, uh, I was motivated in part by uh, the changes in the Supreme Court and uh, uh, the fact that long before uh, Kavanaugh became a member of the Supreme Court, there was a, uh, a shift away from uh, the idea that uh, race conscious programs were, uh, um, were constitutional. 
And then I asked this question as a pragmatist, as a empirical economist, what will work? And so I'm not attached to any slogan. I'm not attached to any you know, particular uh, um, ideological framework. Rather, I want to find out what works and make the case that here's what works. And in the area of public procurement and contracting, it turns out that race neutrality often doesn't work. And so if somebody sues you and says, we think that your disadvantaged business enterprise program, which is a race conscious program, is unconstitutional because it discriminates against white males or it discriminates against Asians. And of course, this is what happened in several uh, court cases in the Third Circuit Court of Appeals and in the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. And then my analysis is, number one, does it work? Does it do what it's supposed to do? Does it hurt third parties? It's an empirical issue. Okay, and it turns out that race neutrality sometimes doesn't work. Now, if it works, then fine, let's go ahead and do it. And so there are a number of specific markets and it turns out that what works in one market doesn't necessarily work for another worker. So my answer right to your question is I was motivated by litigation. I was motivated by people who are being sued. They're being, uh, they're eager uh, to support their programs. But that's one thing I tell everybody when they ask me to assist in their litigation. It says, I am not going to prove that there, I'm not going to guarantee that your program is going to survive. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you whether your program is working. And if it's not working, I urge you to man, a man, clarify, fix the program. Because ultimately, what my commitment is, is my commitment is to achieving racial equality. And I'm concerned about the fact that we do have laws and we do have a constitution and we do have a, a Supreme Court that has gravitated more in the direction of saying, we don't think that anything that takes into account race, let me restate that. We think anything that takes account of race is suspect. And so therefore you need to make a case for A, why there is a state, compelling state interest for having this particular intervention. And B, why did this intervention better than any other intervention that you've tried other interventions. And I think that I can live with that. Okay, so I'm not trying to stack the Supreme Court with people who agree that affirmative action is the only solution to racial inequality. Rather, I'm going to take as given that the Supreme Court is now stacked with people who are antagonistic to race conscious programs. But the race conscious programs have not been deemed unconstitutional. What has been deemed unconstitutional is a race conscious program that fails to meet the strict scrutiny test. In other words, one that is narrowly tailored, that has compelling state interest. And so my motivation, Rod, is my motivation is to work within the confines of the particular system which we live. Now, I met Abba daughter, who's 25 years old. She's the president of the Minneapolis NAACP, and she disagrees with me about uh, doing uh, this kind of marginal analysis you know, focus incremental analysis to focus on, you know, what it is that can work within the confines of the existing system. And her argument as like a lot of other young people is we need to change the system. And I'm very sympathetic uh, to what she's saying because that's how I felt uh, when I was 25 years old. But at the same time, I mean, at this point in my life, what I want to do is I want to see what can we do now, within the current confidence of the system, in order to have a measurable improvement in the relative uh, economic well-being of, of, uh, of uh, 
very short ethnic minority group. Have I answered your question, Your Honor? Yes. And another question, this is actually from one of your colleagues, William Sandy Darity, who is a professor at Duke, and I believe was probably um, in the doctoral program around the same time you were at MIT. And Dr. Darity asks, why are not reparations included in race and gender conscious remedies? So the question is, why are not reparations included in race, gender conscious uh, uh, remedies? I guess I, uh, it is included among. So reparations is one of the most exclusive you know, forms of race conscious programs, and it should have been on the list. And so you say it's my colleague, but I should say that uh, that is one of my dearest and most devoted colleagues uh, who actually gave uh, an alumni seminar you know, last month you know, want reparations. So I do think reparations are explicitly uh, a form of race uh, conscious programs. I thought I said that in the graph. If I did say it in the graph, it said it in the book. However, I do want to make this case, and this is not a disagreement between solidarity and Sam Max, but the case I want to make is that the problem that we're trying to solve for reparations is different from the problem that we're trying to solve with respect to disadvantaged business enterprises or the problem we're trying to solve with respect to admissions to uh, science and technology programs. So I don't think that uh, we should assume that reparations uh, is the only problem. I hope that Sandy will agree that we don't want to focus just on one solution. Rather, we want to look at the multiplicity of problems that uh, we're trying to solve and recognize that some of those problems are, are linked more closely to different types of solutions. And there's another question. This is from Eric Devereaux, who asked about um, just the gap in white perceptions of why there's inequality. And, he asked, so is the first step to better educating the white population about discrimination? That seems to be happening somewhat haphazardly. Do you envision more of a systematic approach? I, I believe that, so my experience in Minnesota is instructive here because it's a very white state. And part of the reason why whites in Minnesota don't think that there's a problem of racism. And in fact, the worst thing that a black person can say, the worst thing that a black intellectual can say in Minnesota is that there's racism. Okay, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble. I've gotten myself in a lot of trouble by even using the word racism to describe uh, racial uh, disparities and racial inequality. But see, here's white people. And I would like to say good white people, by which I mean people who are supportive of egalitarianism, who believe in fairness, who believe. So when I say good white people, I'm saying they're not hustling, they're not showing up at the Trump rallies and they are you know, hollering racial epithets and so forth. I'm not talking about people who are waving the Confederate flag or the Nazi flag, you know, who are making these horrible comments about, uh, about monkeys and other things. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about good white people who are offended by the idea that racism could be, or racial discrimination could be a part of the gaps we have. And I'll be very clear here. These are people who haven't really had much of the interaction with people of color. I put my daughter, I took my daughter to the neighborhood school, public school, the best neighborhood, the best elementary school in the state and talked to the principal and the principal talked about our Negro family or our colored family. And I thought, thought to myself, well, you know, don't you think that's an archaic kind of terminology that our Negro or our colored family, so basically I was asking about diversity in the school and so they, one, one Negro colored family in the school and the principal was bragging was basically, uh, you know, proud of himself that they had one Negro family and oh, they're so good, they come to the meetings and so forth. And I thought to myself, no way am I sending my kid there because I don't want my kid to be at a school where white people's perceptions about minority is kind of exceptional. <laughs> In other words, you're different, you're the other, but 
you're more like us. And so my answer to your question, uh, uh, the question about what is it that explains these uh, differences in uh, white people's attitudes, a lot has to do with uh, not having had any experience dealing with the first group of black people. Almost out of a fear that some of the black people that you're going to interact with might not be like you. Now that's Minnesota, where there are not many black people. But then you go to a place like Washington DC, or you go to a place like Boston, okay, it's where you've had, you have, or New York, where you have a lot of black people, and you still have the problem of white people who isolate themselves physically, uh, walk across the street, uh, don't want to interact with blacks, unless, unless it's a music or athletic, or, or, so there's, there's still, that's a form of exceptionalism. And so that's a, a long-term problem that has its roots in the origins of America. It'll take forever. It'll take a long time to get successions of, 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 of communities of whites and communities of blacks to have some sort of you know, common understanding about what's the difference between doing the electric slide as opposed to doing the country of music nine days. Okay? I mean, they, they don't, do people know? Do people understand that there's a difference? It's, it's a cultural difference. And so what's the difference between uh, uh, um, uh, um, sweet potato pie and pumpkin pie? I mean, I want to put that in an exam question. I actually ought to put that on my exam. There ought to be a question on the SAT exam because the only people going to be able to answer that question are black people. Okay. And so there's this big cultural divide and it, it goes all the way back, you know, to the formation of the country and whether or not we can change it or not change it doesn't seem to be the highest priority. So I'm not actually waiting for white people to change their views in order to be able to implement policies that will uh, remedy uh, existing um, um, disparities. Although the Bremer Foundation funded 38 different anti-racism programs and they believe that the solution uh, in Minnesota, this was in Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, the idea is that if we have, if only we had this communication. When I did evaluation and one of the things I came up with was that number one, the only white people showed up where the white people already were kind of part of the cry. And the second thing is that what white people wanted in anti-racism programs is different from what black people wanted in anti-racism programs. Because it turns out that many of the people who are white have this kind of imaginary notion that why can't we all get along with one another? And the people who are black were saying, we want the jobs, we want the housing, we want the employment. And I have another question, actually. Um, you've invented a term, um, the Minnesota paradox. And I just want to ask, why do you think, and just based on you, of course, being a Minnesota resident and based on your research, um, why is discrimination so prevalent in places such as Minneapolis or, or Milwaukee? Because usually when people think of discrimination or racism, they tend to think of the South. The thing that, the thing that uh, strikes me about uh, the fact that you have a state that has some of the most progressive um, economic policies, some of the most uh, expansive social you know, policies, but yet has some of the largest racial disparities, is the fact that it's grounded on the view that uh, the problem is not racial disparities. The problem is not racism. The problem is not racial discrimination, but rather the problem is poverty. And this interesting phenomenon because it's actually a populist kind of you know, notion that it's not any special racial ethnic group. Rather, it's what we want to do is we want to lift the whole ship that a rising tide would lift all ships. And this is actually what a, a Barack Obama's uh, economists uh, argued. The argument that we would reduce racial inequality if only we we're able to get rid of poverty, if only we we're able, of course, they, uh, Obama's first uh, uh, term came in at a time when there was uh, a depression. So what we need to do is get rid of the depression, get rid of this great recession, and then all Blacks were better off. And the irony of it is it didn't happen. It didn't happen. And this is not an affront uh, to Brother Obama. Rather, it's just a statement about whether or not the economic theory is accurate 
for describing what works and what doesn't work across different groups. And so the Minnesota paradigm is kind of like uh, kind of one of the uh, manifestations of this, uh, this gap between the, the notion that progressive uh, um, uh, pro uh, equity social justice programs solve problems of racial inequality. And it turns out that if it worked in Minnesota, and by the way, Griswold came to Minnesota, was I actually thought it did work in Minnesota. I was excited about coming to Minnesota because Minnesota, I mean, you know, Hubert Humphrey, you know, uh, you know, was the mayor of Minneapolis, the second mayor to fix it in the United States to pass an anti-discrimination law. And this is 1948. And then he went to the Democratic National Convention and he spoke about the importance of eliminating discrimination. And he was the floor manager for the Civil Rights Act 1964. You think that Minnesota of all places would be a place where there would be explicit efforts in order to remedy racial inequality. But it turns out that Minnesota is the place where there are explicit efforts to remedy overall inequality. I'm telling you, there's really, really high tax rates on high income people in Minnesota, which is one reason why a lot of people leave Minnesota and go to other places where uh, the tax rates are, 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 are less uh, progressive. So there's a reason for calling taxes progressive taxes. So we have really progressive taxes. We put money into our schools. We actually are a progressive state, despite what you heard about the small number of people who uh, showed up at Duluth, uh, you know, campaigning for uh, for Trump. But it turns out that that progressivity, progressivity didn't translate into reductions in inequality. Now I'm not an opponent of progressive politics. Rather, I'm just acknowledging the fact that you can have two things going on at the same time. One thing is that there is a belief in equality. And another thing, you have a lot of racial inequality. And my colleague Joe Sauce has a book uh, which points out that all of these progressive policies happen in Minnesota before blacks came. That blacks came. And all of a sudden, People started talking about, you know, fiscal constraints. They talked about how expensive things happen to be and so forth. So that's my long-winded way to, of saying that the Minnesota Paradox, which is actually the title of my next book, uh, is, is one of those uh, um, kind of metaphors for discourse about uh, race versus overall inequality in America. And there's another question, and this is from actually one of your former colleagues, Dr. Howland, who, who apparently was the chair of urban studies and planning at UMD. Uh, Dr. Howland says, it's nice to see you. And they're very surprised between at the difference between the well-educated and the less educated. Um, I believe they're talking about whites in terms of their perceptions of why inequality manifests itself. Do you have a hypothesis or explanation as to why? Uh, well, I mean, I admit that uh, uh, the number, uh, the numbers I'm looking at go to uh, uh, 2016, uh, and I'd be happy to try to figure out whether or not uh, you know things changed in 2018. Uh, but the question is, why uh, do I think that high educated people, uh, highly educated people, share these uh, views about uh, the uh, reasons? for inequality, and I think that a lot has to do with the graduate school experience. I mean, I teach at university, everybody has a PhD, right? You know, everybody, you know, went to Harvard, they went to Yale, they went to Chicago, they went to uh, Michigan and Berkeley. And what type of experience did you have when you were in graduate school? I mean, what type of experience did you have when you were in undergraduate school? You know, went to Brown, you went to, uh, uh, Tufts, you went to Williams, you went to Amherst, you, know, you went to uh, Stanford. Uh, that's how you got into graduate school. And then it turns out that, that among, among my, uh, my white colleagues, and I had good relationships with my white colleagues, there's an amazing amount of ignorance about, uh, about the issues of race. And the reason is that uh, race uh, hasn't actually been a, uh, 
a subject of, of research for the vast majority of academics, except for people in our American Studies program and occasionally for people in sociology programs and so forth. So my answer to the question is that some of it just has to do with ignorance. But another part has to do with priors. What do you believe that's based on the environment you live in? What do you believe based on your own social networks? What do you believe based on... I mean, let's just talk about the issue of genetics, of um, heredity. So the two women uh, who've just won their uh, Nobel Prize in chemistry, you know, have won it based on uh, some very interesting, you know, work uh, related to uh, ways to look at your genes, to look at, you know, the, uh, the genetic makeup of certain types of diseases, like, uh, 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 like, um, uh, diseases that disproportionately affect you know, black people, but you be re really careful that the scientific genetics perspective is actually at the root to a lot of bad things that happen, you know, in our societies. And it turns out that the economics profession you know, has been marked by this uh, particular thing. I took a, a course once uh, with uh, with Paul Samuelson uh, and somebody else uh, at Harvard uh, that were teaching a history economic thought. You know, class, and they were joking about John Stuart Mill and uh, the fact that uh, uh, he had a lot of children, uh, but that most of the children, uh, you know, were not smart. And so John Stuart Mill, James Stuart Mill's son, and the joke in the class was, well, if you got 10 children, then maybe eight of them will be dumb and maybe two of them will be smart. And I thought to myself, I said, you know, that, that, that's kind of ignoring how do we measure smartness? That's ignoring you know, what the role of, of, of pre preschool education is, what the role of, of environment happens to be. But you see, this is something that's like deeply embedded in our profession that we believe that smartness is something that is inherited. Okay, and I'm not saying there's no component that's inherited. I'm just saying that we're in a profession, we're in a science, we, we're in a an enterprise. Remember, we talk, this is the MIT Alumni Association, okay? Who are you talking to? You're talking to smart people. The question is, what's smart? How did you get to be smart? And I think that even in MIT, there's kind of like this little, little ounce of belief in uh, a sort of mating and uh, uh, the idea that, uh, that uh, that inheritance plays an important role, genetic inheritance plays an important role in what happens to your life. I'm sorry I run over time, but anybody who wants to send me an email, please free, feel free to do so. And I think the email addresses uh, should be at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and one last question before we go, can you talk about what your upcoming projects are? What are you working on next? Uh, so my next big project is the Minnesota Paradox Project, uh, even though uh, I have an uh, uh, interesting project that's dealing with disinvestment and Black nonprofits. Uh, so we have uh, some of the big legacy organizations like the NAACP and the Urban Leagues uh, in Minnesota uh, that over the years have lost funding from the major uh, philanthropies and government agencies. And uh, there's new funding coming in to fly by night uh, organizations nobody's ever heard about. Uh, and I'm interested in knowing, you know, well, there's almost so much money out here. And so the, my first task is to try to track where the dollars are going, how the dollars are being used. And the second task is to try to understand the why associated with the perception that uh, there's been a disinvestment in Black organizations in our community. So that's one one big project. The other big project has to do with Alzheimer's. <laughs> and it turns out that uh, the National Institute of, of Health believes that there are racial disparities in Alzheimer's rate. And I want to point out that all the work that I've done uh, that's looking at the Centers for Disease Control Mortality Statistics say that Blacks are less likely to die of Alzheimer's. So why is this the big gap in perceptions about how Black people are dying? And I think part of it has to do with autopsies. So part of that has to do with medical examiners. And this is related to, do you believe everything that comes out of the statistics? And I'm the first person to admit that I believed 
what the son of Jesus said about the mortalities list until I realized where those numbers come from. They come from local coroner's office. And don't you realize that when George Floyd was murdered, the coroner's first statement was that it wasn't murder. And it wasn't until they went back and did another autopsy. I mean, how many autopsies you have to do in order to come to the conclusion that something is a murder? And so that's the reason why I'm looking at that. So it's part of a larger uh, phenomenon of getting the facts right. You know, how do we interpret the data and how can we take an account of things like health statistic data that be begins with the premise that every disparity in health is due to disparities in uh, either behavioral or genetic problems of individuals. And I would say, well, the numbers aren't coming from the individuals, the numbers are coming from systems. The numbers are coming from people like, you know, physicians or, you know, healthcare plans or from, uh, from coroner's office or so forth. And, and do I believe, I mean, what are the qualifications for being a coroner? What are the qualifications for being a medical examiner? And so what we're doing is we're looking up what the certification you know, requirements are. We're looking up what people's ranks are, you know, graduate from medical school. We're looking at, you know, how many complaints they've been against these individuals. We're looking at the racial characteristics. This is not an attack on the profession. It's rather a, a way of looking at systems in a way that deviates from conventional neoclassical economics. And there's a name for this methodology. And it's called stratification economics. And that, that Sandy Darity is the founder of. And so certification economics kind of says, well, you can't just look at individual behaviors. You need to look at the historical antecedents. What are the things that cause these outcomes that might include systems, might include institutions, and so forth? So my answer to your question, my next big project are uh, getting excited about uh, thinking about uh, uh, the broader context the institutional historical context of uh, racial equality. Thank you so much. And on behalf of the MIT Alumni Association, thank you for tuning in to this forum for equity broadcast. And many thanks to our speaker, Dr. Samuel L. Myers of the University of Minnesota. We'll be sure to forward all questions from the Q&A to him today. Our alumni office team will also keep the chat window open for discussion purposes for another 15 minutes. And a reminder that this broadcast will be available on the MIT Alumni Association YouTube channel one week from today. Once again, my name is Rob McCollum. I'm a science writer. And thank you for attending the MIT Forum for Equity. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.